Welcome to my talk uh, on annotations. Uh, I make it a little bit bigger, what you see. Uh, so it's about liberating yourself from the demons that you've created. And so who thinks the annotations in Java are demons? OK, so you don't need to attend this talk. It's for other people, but OK. So let me first introduce myself. So I'm Jarek Ratajski. Yeah. I live in Lucerne under this mountain, and I'm developer, wizard, and an architect. So, uh, yeah, I'm most of my life, uh, professional life, I spent with JVM uh, since year 2000, uh, before I programmed in C++. And on my collection of Pokemons are things like this, like JVM, Java E, Spring, of course, OSGI even, yeah, Java, then JavaScript, TypeScript, Scala, ScalaJ, so oh, a lot of them. and. Uh, I am working for a very great company, CSS Insurance, that's in, uh, okay, it's in Switzerland, so we do health insurance. Uh, con name suggests this, but we don't really insure your style sheets. Maybe in the future. Okay. Uh, the story. So maybe I will introduce you something uh, that I really like. We have, who knows Stack Overflow? <laughs> yeah, you know, of course, because you are developers. Without this, you can't program. I know this. <laughs> so we in Poland have Polish Stack Overflow. Oh, at the moment I'm disconnected from network. Moment, let me f fix it uh, very quickly. I hope I'll fix it. Turn on. I hope I'll be. And it, there is a Polish Stack Overflow that's called, called for programmers net. And that's uh, how it's just a Polish uh, forum for developers. Oh, unfortunately, I can't show you that, but maybe later. And there is a like, Stack Overflow in Polish language, so we are sure that you know every magic knowledge that we put there is only yeah, encrypted for Polish people. It's not publicly available. That's the way we built the great Polish yeah, force of developers. Okay. On, on this uh, forum, I'm quite active, and I'm uh, discussing with people a lot of technologies and problems and things. Uh, yeah, I am known for um, criticizing annotations, Spring, Java e, and things like that. And so I get from time to time a question, how, man, how can you be even serious with that? And one day came a question, how can you? So that was for very from a very good developer, in fact, that I know, that, oh, come on. How can you do something like that? So it's a magic service that does this here is like from some something from data collector to with data extractor. You see that code? Okay, you see the code. Yeah, with, uh, then w filters the data, then uses some generator, etc. So we have a magic service, and of course we sometimes need to parameterize it. So we have to use different data extractor or di different data transformers. So you know, with annotation, it's pretty easy. You put inject everywhere. You know why I use inject, not auto wire or EJB or whatever? Who knows what the inject is? Yes, it's from common dependency injection, so you can b use it both in EJB stack, Java E, and in, uh, in Spring stack. So this way I can, if I'm using inject, I mean I want to offend both parties, not that I... <laughs> because sometimes I'm misunderstood. I'm criticizing something, and people see that I'm criticizing EJB, and think, oh, Spring is much better. No. <laughs> it's the same. So... Okay, I, want to be, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm trying to offend both parties. So the question was how to do that. Who thinks it's possible to do that without annotation easily? Okay, because for me, I said, oh, yes, it's possible, but that's, that's a wrong answer. The, the question is not how to write it without annotation, how to use it without annotation. The question is how have you created such a mess? Because come on, a class, has sex dependencies. Who has heard about a single responsibility principle? There is such thing. You know, single <laughs> versus sex. It's a little bit far. Okay. So, so now, right now, I will tell you a little bit how can what can happen because that's one of the outcomes that may, you may see, and how to avoid that. Okay. 
moment, just have a technical issue. You know, I'm not using annotations, so everything can happen. Okay. So container-based dependency injections problem. I'm facing, I am, by the way, I'm working on my daily basis, basis with containers, with Spring and with Java E. That's the way I hate both. So that's the typical thing we have. Okay, not that common in code, but there is a user activity logger where for a given user ID, we, we have some user repository, and from time to time, maybe be because it's some kind of the business log, we want to store activity. What was user doing? For instance, maybe he was bu buying something on the page. He was, I don't know, creating a policy for insurance, whatever. So we have this code here. And then some unlucky developer uses it like that. User activity logger with my user perfect, that's the constructor, store activity. And you know what's, what happens there. What happens? Null pointer, of course. Be why null pointer, nine pointer? Because the developer used the new keyword. Because the first thing, once you start with injections, container-based injections, you learn that new is kind of forbidden. Because all the classes must have beans, otherwise they won't work. That's so so that, that's the magic the, the, the young developers learn, and they, they preserve it later. Yeah? So no new keyword. It even goes farther. May let's, let's, let's say we fixed it. Typical fix, maybe that was a request. Who knows requests code beans? Cool. So those beans that are really only for the, because you know, the typical bean in the in, in um, Spring version is just a global singleton. Oh, who, who likes global? So we can be smarter, you use local singletons. There are, those are scoped requests. So we put something in a request scope, like a user repository, it's the same. This time it is a bean. I don't discuss how it was injected, but of course it wasn't created with a new. And then we realize maybe we'll store this activity, but it's not that crucial, so maybe we can do it in the ba background task with executor service. There are such things. Or maybe we used parallel streams, whatever. Who knows what, what happens here if I do it like that? What? Yeah, so th that's the problem, because request scope are really tied to the thread of the request. If you do something outside of this thread, like here, on the other, then you get typically null point exception again. So the lesson two, if you use container-based dependency injections, is typically that you know, okay, threads, we don't touch them. Threads are forbidden. So great, no new, no thread, no threads, okay. Then the real problem that I really face is sometimes what is the life cycle of a bean? Because in, in Java, it's very simple. Object is created with a constructor, then I can use it. What can happen with this stuff? It is created somehow, and maybe I can use it. Bec um, maybe the something wasn't injected yet. You know this method like post construct. So in Java, it's very simple, life cycle. You have a constructor, after that you use object. In this stuff, you have a constructor which maybe constructs. Mostly not, because then after construction come, come, come the injections of the fields and etc. etc. So it's really great for debugging. And that's the, the, the thing I wanted to show with this magical service. Because it's so easy, oh, it's so easy, like in basic. In, I've started programming with basic in 1990. It was really great language because I could really be very fast, because all the variables were global. That makes you fast. So. People from these technologies that are selling you this stuff learned, if you make everything global, it's very fast. So you are very fast, and you can create beans with 15 dependencies. Cool, because everything is global, it's no problem. So great, great job. Uh, and then the, the, the thing that I'm really working every day, so runtime problem detection. The system compiles, goes through all the tests, and then null pointer exceptions or detached object, whatever happens on production, once in a month. Cool. That's exactly, and the problem is, if you have null pointer exception in Java, in a normal Java, without this stuff, what do you do? Either you read it directly where it is, and you know how it happened, or you put a debug line, and you can analyze. How do you debug that the, con that the container didn't inject something? Where do you put those breakpoint? I don't know, it's really, it's really challenging. The other thing is that if you write this way, 
That's the, that's the thing I learned in a company, and uh, in fact, I work for a few companies already, even Capgemini, whatever, that the Java program is typically composed of getters and setters. And on top of that, mappers from getters to setters. So once we, I took a part in some kind of workshop where we were trying to fix some just random code from the console, so we were just mm, uh, running some metrics, selecting which code looks bad, but maybe fixable, and then you know, from 10 teams doing that, nine of them selected mapper. Then I realized the whole logic that we have in the company is just mappers. Cool. That's, that's what we wanted to write. Okay, it's not really that bad, but it's really the code that we see as, as bad. That's, those are mappers. Okay, let's go further. Encapsulation problem. So, you know, sometimes you want to hide some stuff, but with with if injections work so easily, you can inject anything to whatever. So where is the encapsulation? It's gone. Okay, cool, because that makes you faster. Encapsulation really slows you down. That's what we learn. So all those problems that I select to you, five years ago, my answer would be learn more, more annotations. Because if you read, I don't know, 15 books about EJB and Spring, you learn for every of this problem, background task, whatever, there is a specific annotation that fixes the problem. And then you will have even better hull of annotations that all of that will be very, very consistent and will be working. But I have a conclusion to that. It's just not Java anymore. It's some, you know what's this? Because I was programming in 2000 with Java. I was doing this big system with brick XMLs. Really, who, who has programmed really XML in the past? So th that was officially a Java developer, but in reality, that's what is XML writer. So I was XML writer and realized this stuff is simply this, uh, the same XML, but just embedded in Java sources. It's just like this. Is it really that better? Actually, it is a little better to have it in Java sources, but it's really not the change that I wanted. So solution. There is a solution posted from the guy I wouldn't expect to help me. So you probably heard, who has seen this topic before? Why field injection is evil? Yeah, so it's from Oliver Gierke, so from Spring. Guy, really great. And he posted this. There is a page uh, on that in the internet. You can read it. That uh, with this example, that this field injection is generally broken because, okay, that's exactly what I was trying to say. That's just begging for no pointer exception. I totally agree. And he proposed a solution that's already working perfectly in Spring. You can use constructor. Oh, annotated with inject, but generally constructor. And then you put it here, uh, your dependency, and it works. And you have, like in normal Java, you have constructor. You can't use it directly because it's injected here, but it's a step to better. Well, so, and he stated there, which I totally agree, this approach means better testability. You can test this thing without a container and without morphing, which I uh, then talk about later. Dependency is excess. So we, if you have six of them, you will already see the problem because you will be writing six uh, parameters constructor. So it's better to see the problem earlier. Yeah, great. It's ex exactly. Because if it's uh, 10 or 16, it's already too late to fix it. It's just horrible. So if you see that you are adding fourth dependency, then you might think about refactoring or whatever. So and it's better encapsulation. Really, constructor constructs an object that really is finished. And like it's supposed to be an object-oriented programming. OK, so there is this post. And I think it's a really step to the better world. It's not the final step. Because what, is, what was mix missing there is my point of view. Dependency injection is great. In the moment, from this Oliver Gierke mm, example, we remove this one last inject. So you stay with just constructor. Because command dependency injection doesn't really mean you have to use container. It's just the way that you combine your object, that you compose your object in a way that you, you don't nest some abstraction in you unwanted transaction in your code. So the answer, in fact, I took time and I refactored, uh, refurbished completely the original code of the poster with this magic service, with these six annotations. Uh, it took me really a lot of uh, steps to do that. A moment. I just do some magic with my presentation engine. It to took me a lot of steps to do that, but the outcome was I, was, I, got, I got some really nice code, 
Uh, th this story is posted on the internet, but I, I can send, uh, send you <coughs> a link later. So the magic service, after few iterations of changes, became this class. Magic servers with, magic service with two, two dependencies. And those both two data producers and data producer, pr processor have some others. And we be became more testable. And I could use it with new keyword, like normal human beings. And it was just a Java. <laughs> By the way, I have also removed, for instance, exceptions and changed them to either. Who knows either? From Java slang. It's great. You should stop using checked exception and try to convert to try or to either. It's really way better. Uh, OK. Let's go further. And by the way, if you are thinking it's probably not that sophisticated, in fact, indeed, people use some patterns that help with this dependency injection done well with Java. So for instance, there is a cake pattern. I don't have enough time to discuss it detailed, but the, the cake pattern comes from, in, where I've seen it, it's from Scala world. So how can you compose objects and how can you uh, Mm. Disjoin uh, this this part when you decide which are the final implementations. That's the that's the that's the, the value we want to. So we want to write clean logic, but we don't want to embed their exact implementation. For instance, if it was MongoDB or we use, uh, for instance, in memory DB or whatever, we don't want to put it in directly in the code because it would make code less testable. So there is a solution for that. It's very funny with. Uh, like right now default methods in interfaces. So exactly the usage we will see at the end. Uh, like for instance, we can now right now have local user repository component that is using creating repository from, uh, I don't know, maybe in memory, whatever uh, repository, and Mongo user repository. That's, on, that's only an example. It comes from the Stack Overflow, in fact. And then I can create a class. Uh, Local app that uses with, with implements user service component and local user repository component. That's the Java approach for the cake pattern. This is a little bit verbose, not that that elegant as the Scala one, but it solves problem. And there are another problems. Sometimes <coughs> you have this. I don't really like this, but maybe you are lost. What's the first? I have a couple of objects, and I just lost the idea what I have to create first, what later. In Scala, there is a great construct called lazy val. So it means the value that will be evaluated when it's needed. And if, some, for instance, this service needs another service to be constructed, it all will be automatically created. By the way, of course, Spring does it for you pretty well, but you don't need a Spring for that. Or you don't need EJB. You can do, for instance, lazy. That's from uh, with lazy. That's a class from Java Slang again, the same place where either comes. And then I, for instance, I can create a lazy service one, lazy service two, and in by creating implementation service one, I'm using service two, and it will be automatically lazy evaluated with the correct order. Quite honestly, I'm not using those patterns too often. Because in reality, I use it, make it very simple. So that's my, that comes from that sample project I posted on a GitHub. That's uh, where I had a user service that wa was using two, kind, two types of repository. User repository, maybe a database with users, and session repository, so mostly in memory storage for sessions. Like typically somebody logs into the game in this case, and, or you register user to the game. So, this is how the class looks like. I don't go into the data, but we see two repositories. So one solution would be maybe to say that there is a default default constructor, and then I decide, uh, let's use new, uh, I don't know, MySQL repository and in-memory session repository. So I could use default constructor here. And that would work, that is quite okay solution. But it makes you makes your user service right now really knowing something about the details. So it makes it less abstract. That's a bro breaking of abstraction. That's mi mi mixing of abstraction. So exactly dependency injection in the core means that I can remove this. I can remove this part of code when I decide to some other class. In this case, it, quite often I, I name those classes like that. User module. So user module is simply, in my module of users, a special class that's Quite honestly, that's the XML. You don't see the XML because it is Java. It's exactly the, the decides which are my default repositories, yeah, which are for sessions for users, and I put this code there. 
all the stuff that I need to create objects, to really inject. I use this class in tests, I use this class for, uh, for while constructing other services. That's very simple, and that's natural, object-oriented way of just doing dependency injection. No container here. No magic. Simple like that. But, of course, sometimes you, when you try to do this, you find an obstacle, really. Who is using Tomcat on a daily basis? Who is using some kind of other application server, like, I don't know, WebSphere, whatever? So, who is using something completely different? So, who is using Jetty? Who is using Ratpack? Oh, one guy, so, exactly. The, that's the thing. We've used this classical servlet-based application servers. Your, your choices are quite limited. This won't be really funny, because the real fun is that you can really use the dependency injection in the right way one while you, in the moment you make yourself free from this yeah, ugly stuff. And I will show you this. Solution is exactly, for instance, the rat pack. So that's the, how can you write REST service in Java without containers, without application servers? So, you know, program should be like a story. And I learned something about the stories. The if you want a cool story in Java, it must start with what? The only good stories in Java. They start with public static void main. Something that is long forgotten in history, but it's the only way to really make it well. So, by the way, this is not a nice part of the rat pack. I have to declare this throw exception. But then, I, right now, I'll create a server for you. It's really easy. Create server. That's my, class, my, my method. I will just define it right here. So it's like a static rat pack server. That's a class from rat pack. Uh, create server, that's my method. Throws exception, that's not really nice, I know. But for, for simplicity, I use it here. I will return a rat pack server of such definition that for rat pack server specification, I will, with this specification, say that, that the server config is done this way. Uh, by the way, it's not really needed. I wanted to show you how to configure a server. I will conf configure this server with one thread. By the way, it's great because it's a non-blocking server, so it means even one thread can handle, uh, I don't know, thousands of connections, concurrent. That's not a problem. If you don't believe me, you can try it. And it's even, m quite often, it's more performant than a lot, lot of threads in uh, Tomcat. There is a reason, technical reason for that. You can read about mechanical sympathy and stuff like this. So. That's, I would like to create a server with Fibonacci, counting Fibonacci. So I decide that there is a one handler <coughs> that after prefix Fibo will, with parameter n, will just count me Fibonacci number. And so it should be easy. Uh, by the way, I, I put it to some other class, okay? Mm, moment. So it's like this. Other handlers I could put, put here. And then <coughs> I can, I just, just at the moment, moment, I make it a li little bit better. That's what, how I created the server, really. Right now, uh, the only thing missing is I have to create this method, Fibonacci. And it will be, okay, the handler for a moment. Handler looks like this. And then the method Fibonacci, sorry, just a just, just couple of seconds before creating real server. As you see, I'm using a lot of lambdas, because the, in fact, the Java 8 lambdas made writing such server is really easy. It was possible before, but wasn't really looking nice. Right now it looks, for me, quite okay. If you get used to syntax, you are very, very performant with this, this approach. So, and right now I will call Fibonacci, and yeah, that's it. And then method Fibonacci. Okay, let's, let, me, let me do this. So Fibonacci, I'm doing it with this slow to show you how, the, how it really takes to create a server, and it would be Fibonacci, you know, very, very easy. We can create it like that, Fibonacci n minus 1, that's the best, best uh, approach to Fibonacci ever, the fastest, of course, you know that, it's great. So that's the server, and maybe let me, let me try this server, I will prepare for myself here the code, sorry you don't see this, but I will see the server is not yet started. I don't have a great engine to start it here. 
So it will be not, not perfect, but if I right now call this, I should see the Fibonacci, fifth number of Fibonacci, it's eight, how cool. So it worked, yeah, great. So eight number of Fibonacci is 34, uh, super. So I had a server, so what was this, X this for? If you do write server, this public static void main, this all dependency injections manual, poor man's DI with Java, it works so much easier for you. So the server doesn't break you. By the way, the great thing about this is how you test that. So I won't click the code, I will just show you. That's how you test the server. There's the best test, the black box testing. Inside of the test, I start the server exactly the, the way I've written it, and then I'm using the HTTP client, I assert that the server is giving me the exact response. So a lot of you would, f would think that kind of testing is stupid, because starting a server, wow, that, Every test, that costs a lot. You know how much time the rat pack starts? Even, it's not this configuration, the real one, with a couple of services. Who knows this? 100 milliseconds, 16. So I measured really in the project where I had some, something more complicated than Hello World, that was 16 milliseconds for each server start in a test. Come on, this means I can s make over 50 such tests in a second. That's already good enough. Okay. And I think that's the way you should test REST, serv REST services if you, like, if you prepare them. Okay, but what if you have containers? So inside of CSS insurance, physicians, we use a lot of Java EE. We have containers. So how do we deal, deal with them? We've created, in fact, quite, quite nice pattern. Because when you are in doubt, that's the lesson from last year, you should build a wall. So we've built a wall. That's typical. We have some... Bin, and that's the problem because some inside of uh, our server gives us entity manager, gives us connection to other bins, and all this good stuff. So, how can we keep being clean? So, we, cre we in fact use objects that exactly have this name delegate. And then, inside of the business method, uh, the bin method, we call, create this delegate, which is way cleaner. That's not a bin, that's a Java class, real one. And then we have their entity manager and maybe some logic, the calculator. And by the way, here is the final class that we test. Sorry, just that's uh, I don't write here, but it's typically in this class we don't use database. That's our logic. So we're writing this way in our business, and we are agile. It changes the rules every time they want. So they are allowed to. So with this method, we have quite clean cal calculator which we can adapt every day, and we'll see what, what tests are broken, and we can discuss with the business. Once we are ready with the clean business logic, we can check it with a real database. Because really, come on, I will, uh, hope I will have time to uh, t talk about it. You have to test with the real database, mostly, because you can have errors in SQLs, whatever. So we are right now, this is a little bit more dirty class server del service delegate, and it tests this logic against the real database. Okay, mostly in memory, it's fast enough. And at the end, we don't really test those bins because it means we would have to start the server. What we do is really do a smoke test. Has the server started? It means that mostly bins were constructed, it's okay. So by the way, it's just the, who has heard clean architecture from Uncle Bob? So it's not the way Uncle Bob proposed, but it's alternative approach how to stay clean. So the, the approach from Uncle Bob I find not that comfortable, but okay, it's, we can discuss that, but uh, it's alternative. But this is kind of clean architecture. Keep your code clean, core code clean. Okay, does it mean that there are no sensible uses from, for this dependency injection, like inject EJB, auto wired, whatever? I think there are. If you are building a project that is composed of some kind of plugins, you have different jars, you have three jars, you, for one customer you deploy two, for other customer three jars, maybe then the solution would be to use auto-wired. It's, it's great for that. But if the whole code is mostly, that's, that's mostly what we do, backend systems that is exactly have one customer or all the times are deployed the same, then it's just misuse. You don't need a container for that. So every time you inject something that is not known and compile time, you may think uh, about using these things. But otherwise, I don't think so. Okay, so that's one topic, probably the biggest one. But right now I have to address other things. So this is really for me 
connected. In fact, uh, yeah, if you do it, it will suffer. I found this in the Wikipedia, this text, and it really describes disturbance of stomach, digestion, loss of appetite. If you do it, you will suffer this. You know what I am talking about. Lack of libido, bag of pain, whatever. finally suicide even. I even found in a very old book, it was French, so I'm not really sure if they were describing that what I think, but I think it is, that that's more than 100 years old book, so I didn't know they were so, were so technical advances, the, the picture of the guy doing that. You know what I am talking about? Mockists. <laughs> Mockists. That's the, sorry for me, it's just TDD masturbation. Sorry. Like, and it typically comes with this kind of dependence injection. You have six injections, so you mock them, and then you test. So this code comes from the real post. Somebody was tr asking for a review of code. That's one that was on this Polish Stack Overflow for programmers page. So if it's test, this test is OK. So we have flashcard service that uses flashcard repository this way, and then we test it. Great test. So when flashcard service find all, then return get flashcards. That's the mocked response. And then we assert that. What is this test testing, do you know? It's testing Mokito. It's a great job for open source project. So some people may say, ah, that's a mistake here, because the guy shouldn't have mocked the flashcard service. He should have mocked flashcard repository this way. Would it be better? Oh, uh, kind of. But come on, I've seen the code that had here, like, I don't know, six calls of something, blah, call something, call something, and at the end, mocked response. So no matter how bad was the system, all this co code here was not really working, but the final response was mocked, and the tests were, were green. Cool, you can go to production without any problem. So, okay, I don't cover this topic, but that's what I typically see. It's more often than I would even expect. So it's called even the London School of TDD. It's People use it, they think it's okay, but it's a great danger of testing only mocks. And by the way, this is a great <laughs> way to help open source, to help exactly the author of Mokito, Stepan Faber. He has the Faber, he has the best tested uh, framework in the world. And the, the, I've heard another answer. If you use Mokito verified, then you, then you will test everything exactly. If this implementation is exactly working like that, Okay, I totally agree, but then what happens? You have tests that exactly make, uh, repeats everything that you have in the implementation. That's a great help while, do, uh, while you are doing repa refactoring, because every time you do refactoring, you have to completely change the test. Makes sense, don't you think so? Okay, so, and by the way, I don't say mocking is totally bad. If you have some external resources, I.O., whatever, then mocking is just necessary, and it's just very okay. Mokito is great then. The question is, is database external? Who thinks database is external system, and you should mock database? Who thinks it's internal? So <laughs> both parties are right, even those undecided. It depends. If somebody comes to you, to your team, and says, that's a Oracle database on this host with this password, whatever, you have these tables, use them. This is way, this way, and describe. That's a pro describes the protocol, how you cooperate with database. That's external system. That's your API, in fact. Poor database-driven, but API you have to use. If somebody says, you have to persist this, 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 and information, and then you say, maybe I will use Oracle or MySQL, and we will use those tables, whatever, that's an internal thing. If it's internal, you have to test it. Because of that, for instance, we test with Entity Manager our things, so we are sure if we are doing them right. So, final tema, uh, topic I want to uh, discuss is to, let's talk about aspects. So, not all the annotations are about injection thing. There are aspects, very, very important. For instance, on this picture, you see, aspect. That's, that's really, I think it's from um, Spring uh, tutorial. Pre-authorized house permission, has permission. Spring security is great. You can use all these annotations. And then transactional concepts and whatever. Then you have, you can mark with those, that unnecessary stuff, your method, and concentrate on your job. You can even write your own. Who has written and uh, um, how it's called uh, in interceptor anytime or aspect? 
Great. That's a great way of doing code because then you have to face with real object-oriented programming because every time you, whatever you take, it's an object. It's cool. It's really, absolutely, there is no reason you could make error here. It's perfect. Okay, that's, but, but people like to write those aspects. It's really the, the, the masterpiece of the technology, write another aspect, cool. So there are such aspects, transaction, cache, validation, whatever, security, the, and yeah, we have annotations for that, of course, what, what else, yeah? And people say, you see, this is really, this is declarative. No, that is not declarative. That is absolutely not declarative. This is, this is pathetic stuff, and what I call it, it's stringly typed. So you have strongly typed, uh, languages, uh, this is stringly typed system. You have the real logic in the strings. Cool. Kay. So, can we do something about it? So, yes, we can, of course. There is, there is in. So, that's, a, that's a something that comes from my code. Do the x, so do transactional, that takes a function from a session, that's hibernate session, to t, that's my result, and takes a db command, that's command, just the function. And this is how I use it. Do, do transaction, maybe this is static method, sorry, I didn't mention that, public, static. So it's written once for a system. And then you can use it. With a session, I just using Hibernate session, at the end it's committed here. And even in this system I needed something like that. Sometimes was appearing constant violation exception, but if the transaction was retried, it would just disappear. So here, some very crazy stuff. With recursion, we can retry the transaction. Of course, mostly you don't need something like that, and maybe we'll end with stack overflow here. In other cases, in this case, that was a real solution. So you can, this is high order com concept function. That's thing you can do without any problems right now. And by the way, doesn't, it doesn't mean you have to write this do the x method. By the way, I typically need a tree of them. They're already written. There is a great project, JOQ from Lucas, Leder, uh, uh, Lucas Eder, that, and exactly, they, it provides you those methods. So exactly here, I have create transaction, and they I have transaction con configuration. It is exactly the object that ha has all these sessions and things that, that you need. And at the end, you insert to database with the uh, fancy way, functional way that uh, Lucas provides. This is the way you can do it without any annotation, just functional way with hard order functions. This is so much easier to test, to debug, whatever. Yeah, so that's a great thing. The same thing you can do with uh, secure. For instance, here is a case where I do do secure method, and then for every request, if a person has per permission right, I can use this. So of course, right now, this permission thing is embedded in code. Is it bad? No, it's not really bad because you can debug it. If it doesn't work, you don't have just null pointer exception or everything works. You can debug it. It's cre great. You can provide your own implementation. That's cool. Okay. So, good annotations. All annotations are bad. Not really. We have a couple of annotations that I consider quite okay. Couple of them. Who knows? Oops, oops, oops. Sorry. Something has just obscured my system. Overwrite and functional interface. Both of them are for compiler. It's great because you can use them to, for instance, check if the functional interface is really functional interface or, or something really happened. Who knows immutable? That's a new thing. You can mark uh, your classes and it's immutable. And by the way, there is a project in the internet, the whole game, Pong game, that I've written only using immutable code. It was possible. Not using annotations, just immutable. And right now you can do it in Java. So writing f f fully functional code in Java. Real thing, real stuff. Nullable, that's okay. Oh, by the way, you shouldn't use null at all. But there are moments when you cooperate with some API and then you uh, say, okay, this API needs null, so maybe I will mark that this thing is nullable. Okay, I can agree, sometimes you need it. But then there is not null. Who thinks that not null is okay annotation? There are a couple of people, I think it's horrible. Because in the first place, you should never use null. And if you should never use null, does it mean you have to put not null everywhere? Not null, not null, not, not null, null. That would be great. So I should say, not being not null, not nulling, is just mandatory. So this thing should be just skipped. It just should be assumption. So only in these rare cases where you have null, you could use nullable. 
That's the point. There are some other, you for, for instance, test dynamics that you fr know from JUnit that help you the build system to find out what's the test. So compile build time checks with annotations are OK. I com completely agree. That's exactly, for instance, Scala uses the same. So that's that's OK thing. So what do we have next? Maybe there are some other serialization annotations. JSON serialize, JSON created XML root. There are a lot of them. Are they OK? I say they are efficient. I would, but it's not perfect solutions. For instance, in Scalawet, they already migrated those, uh, those things to macro-oriented solutions. Macro, macros sound bad, I think, for you, macro. But really, in Scala, they did these macros not that bad, and quite a way. Seeing the, problem, seeing the problem at compile time with macros is far better than seeing a problem with reflection uh, at runtime, which happens when you have these uh, annotations. But for a moment, in Java world, that's the only solution that I would say is efficient. So yeah, we, we can accept them. I can accept them. I can live. But right now, another topic, very similar. I, I like the history. I le read a lot of books, and I even read some papers from the past, from medieval. So that, that's what I find. You know the, what is this? That's quite famous paper, paper, Magna Carta. John by the grace, God of King of England, blah, 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 blah. That's preamble. So every medieval tract starts with preamble. And then you think that, that comes the real part. No. No, that before, that's the second part. You know, and it goes farther when you check it. Blah, first. No, it not, not real starts, and then I marked it yellow, starts a real sentence they wanted to refer. But a lot of preamble before, because, you know, writing in the medieval time was like a bit, a little bit of magic, so you had to put some incantation. And, you know, that's this Magna Carta thing, and I realized I, I see this pattern in Java. Sorry, there's a real code, I, so I cannot show you what's there, but preamble is with annotations like bis, to this moment. It's two-thirds. Part of this code are, is preamble. What kind of? I'm talking about serialization to database. So it's, it's JPA. Really, we have these monsters with JPA. That's the real thing. Named query, named query, named query, and then column, I don't know, table, yeah, and a lot of other stuff, I don't know, cached, uh, B, good, NTT, blah, blah, please true, a lot of done, and then at the end, this poor little entity, really, really far away. That's what I see. And OK, I don't cover this topic, but I don't think it's really normal. Something wrong has happened here. So writing, for instance, this SQL with some <laughs> regular library, not that magic, would be probably more sensible. So it's just, for, for JPA is too verbose, but there is a second problem. I don't have to discuss, uh, I don't have time to discuss this, uh, but really, there are a lot of plaques of JPA, especially, I would say, people know SQL. Developers I work with know SQL. They know how to solve the problem with SQL. And then they spend a week trying to, for instance, do bidirectional association with JPA and convert the queries to JPA query language. How cool is that, yeah? And they, for instance, that's especially like manage data object. So I have object, so I assume I can call a method, not in JPA, because maybe there is a lazy fetch and the object is detached. So how can I know, know that, that the object is detached? How do you know that the object is detached from the session and you, you, don't, you can't call the method on that? It's very easy. You just have to track all the code down. After a week, you will know. S super. So great. So generally, I would say JPA, from my point of view, 10 years ago, I thought it was a perfect thing. But right now, I s right now I might experience that people only waste time with that. And if you have a problem, productive problem with JPA, like with managed data, quite, I fixed the, this kind of problem last week, for instance. It took two days. Two days fighting with JPA because exactly one of the beans there wasn't the real bean. It was CDI bean, not as, even though marked with stateless. And because if it was CDI bean, it wasn't starting a transaction, so I have detached objects somewhere. How cool. It was really funny. So in JOQ or MyBatties, you write something that looks like SQLs directly. You have very easy life cycle. If you update, it's updated. How cool is that? With JPA, where is the update in JPA? It's missing. So 
because there is a dirty checking. Everything is automatically flashed to the database. This is very, very smart, but developers don't understand that. So I even worked with a very smart architect that has seen this problem, and he provides for them update methods. So you could call it update with an object. You know, this method was empty, but it was OK to make developers satisfied. They were f have this feeling that, OK, they saved to database. In fact, they were. OK, so I, I propose you don't use this magic. JPA is not the best solution. You have easier. So I am going to, to end this talk. So resources for that. Great resource is this field-based injection is evil. Mario Fusco created, so, so rewritten uh, Gang of Four to Lambda. So how can you do, do this stuff better? Because previously, this, all these aspects and things like that, we had to do, we had to do with uh, yeah, object-oriented way, way with patterns. It's so much easier right now to use just high-order functions. Nothing more. There's a great video of that. I think that this talk will be made today. So use this. Use this power. Dependency injection inversion from Uncle Bob. He exactly says the same. It's great, dependency injections. You don't need any container for that. Annotation mania. It's a really great page that uh, shows you what, what, what authors think about annotations. So, and Technology rather about application servers. If you don't believe it, nobody should right now use application servers. Yeah, if you start your no project. And, and there, there is a one project I made to show that with a rat pack, how do you create a yeah, clean uh, auto notation free architecture? It's called rat punk. OK, so maybe just last words. Annotations were great, but uh, solved some limitations of Java 1.4 and 5, but relies on magic. And this magic really hurts after a moment. In the year 2017, use lambdas, don't use application servers. Your motto should be compiler first, and Switzerland second, no, uh, <laughs> test second. And reflection magic last, and let's make Java great again. And <laughs> OK, one question. There is a time for one question. Oh, from Mario. That's going to be hard. <laughs> uh, you didn't mention it, but do you think that also the reader monad could be a good substitute for the dependency injection uh, problem? I didn't try that, but I could try. Maybe, okay. yeah. One more question? OK, no. Okay, so thank you. Ah, one uh, one. How can you use a red pack in a company like CSS? Because I expect you have also to use some container which you get from the technical infrastructures. Um. So CSS like style sheets and things like that. <laughs> no, no. No, no. I mean the company. Uh, in company. Yeah. So at the moment in company, we have mostly web speed and we have other servers uh, like Adobe, whatever. And, but we are exactly in this moment, we are building first uh, server for servers ba based on Docker, when you just start fat jar and you do what you... It's all not the moment, not in production yet. It will come later. We'll see. Yeah, that's... Okay, I am in a company that has some limitations. Because of that, we use this wall pattern. We, we, don't, we are not really adapting everything. We are trying, we are showing, but not that it goes to production that next month, of course. It's insurances. But I think it will come. That's the goal. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.